IB Bio, Diversity Evolution Classification Part 1, will focus on the evidence that supports evolutionary theory. The essential idea is there is overwhelming evidence for the evolution of life on Earth. It's important to note at this point that when I refer to the word theory, I mean it in the strictest definition, a well-tested scientific concept, a concept with a lot of supporting data. Too often, people use the word theory to describe a concept for which little is known or incorrectly use the word theory as a synonym for hypothesis, which is nothing more than an educated guess. Theory refers to a scientific concept for which a lot is known. Evolutionary theory is well supported by multiple lines of evidence, and I will present just some of the evidence in this movie. The outline of topics for the evolution core unit is provided here. Use this outline to find the movie you need. This movie is focused here. Here are four definitions of the term evolution. Process by which modern organisms have descended from ancestral organisms. When heritable characteristics of a species change over time, in other words, descent with modification. Continuous genetic adaptation of populations through mutation, selection, and drift, and a change in the allele frequency in a population's gene pool over a number of generations. Work to understand each of these definitions and be able to recall two of them clearly. Ask questions in class as need be. So here are the first two IB syllabus statements. Define evolution. I just did that on the previous slide. But the statement that is the essence of this movie is Outline the evidence for evolution provided by the fossil record, selective breeding of domesticated animals, homologous structures, and the analysis of nucleotide sequences in DNA. The lines of evidence that support evolution are these. The IB wants you to be aware of fossil evidence, selective breeding, homologous structure, and an analysis of nucleotide sequences in DNA. We will start this movie with the fossil record. First, the fossil record provides a record of extinction, clear evidence of change in populations on Earth over time, and not just extinction, but the arrival of new species as well. Secondly, in the fossil record, we see similarity of form between extinct organisms and more modern organisms. And thirdly, in the fossil record, we see transitional species, species that provide clear links between ancestral species and those that lived more recently. The fossil record provides evidence of evolution because we can see modern organisms descending from ancestral organisms. Forms of life now extinct can be dated using radioactive isotopes embedded in the rock within which the fossils are found, or the relative age can be determined by the layering of the fossils in the rock oldest layers are deep and the younger layers above. The fossil record allows scientists to see forms of life that are now extinct, evidence of change on Earth. The fossil record provides evidence of evolution because we can see modern organisms descending from ancestral organisms. The dating of fossils allows scientists to understand the change in form over time, the transition from one form to another over time. The fossil record is not a jumble with all forms mixed together. As can be seen here, the older form would have been found in this layer and the younger form in this layer. And the older form is less familiar to us than the younger form because we're more likely to see familiar structures in species that have lived more recently. The organisms presented on this slide are known to scientists from the fossil record. The upper organism was discovered in 320 million year old rock, while the lower organism was discovered in 380 million year old rock. The similarity in form is striking, particularly the overall shape and the backbone. The older organism has lobed fins, presumably adapted for movement in water, while the younger organism has limbs that appear to be adapted to movement on surfaces, the bottoms of ponds or on land, but we must be careful not to make assumptions about how the limbs were used. The similarity in form suggests a common ancestor, 
and the functional differences in the limbs of these two organisms suggest descent with modification. Sequences in the fossil record of species, such as this, provide evidence of descent with modification from a common ancestor. The fossil record, as can be seen here, provides evidence of evolution, the process by which modern organisms have descended from ancestral organisms. Acanthostega is a 350 million year old fossil found in Greenland by Jenny Clack, a paleontologist from the UK. Acanthostega has a limb that is transitional between the lobe fin and a more articulated limb suitable for motion on the bottoms of ponds or on land. Jenny Clack has postulated that Acanthostega moved about on the bottoms of shallow seas and ponds. The limb's advantage in moving around on the bottoms of ponds may have been a pre-adaptation for its use by descendants of Acanthostega for movement on land. These are photographs of the original Acanthostega fossil. You can see the digits of the forelimb here and highlighted here. Acanthostega represents a transitional species in that its limb was no longer used to swim in the water column, but instead used to move about on a surface, serving as a transition to terrestrial forms, land-based forms. In a different example of what might be called a transition species, we see in Archaeopteryx here both a drawing on the left and a photograph of the fossil on the right. Archaeopteryx lived 150 million years ago and was known to have feathers. This is what makes the Archaeopteryx fossil so interesting. But Archaeopteryx was a reptile with teeth and a long bony tail. No bird species alive today have teeth or a long bony tail. Archaeopteryx was a reptile with feathers. Now the thinking is that today's birds are not the direct descendants of Archaeopteryx, but that birds did evolve from reptiles, organisms like Archaeopteryx. In this slide, I'm comparing the Archaeopteryx with modern birds. Remember, the Archaeopteryx is known to us from a 150 million year old fossil. We can see a lot of similarity in structure between the two organisms, but remember, the Archaeopteryx is a reptile. It has teeth and a very long reptilian tail. Also notice that the bones of the forelimb of the Archaeopteryx are not fully fused in the way that they are for modern birds. For modern birds, the, the forelimb supports a wing for flight. Also notice the sternum, the breastbone, to which muscles for flight are attached. Modern birds have a huge sternum to which the large flight muscles are attached, while the Archaeopteryx has a very small sternum. The Archaeopteryx probably did not fly. So the Archaeopteryx serves as a window on what transition species might look like, in this case transition, between reptiles and modern birds. The evolution of modern whales is well recorded in the fossil record. The evolution of the whale had been quite a mystery because whales are mammals and we know mammals to have evolved on land. Whales evolved from a terrestrial organism known as Pachycetus, a four-legged wolf-like organism that lived approximately 50 to 60 million years ago. Pachycetus, clearly terrestrial, has a structure near to the ear that can only be found in modern whales and their immediate ancestors. But the fossil record has provided a very nice sequence of fossils that display change over time among whale ancestors, with transition species becoming more and more adapted to aquatic habitats. In Rhodocetus, seen here, you can clearly see a change in the limbs that would better suit the species for living in water. In Doryodon, a species that lived approximately 35 to 40 million years ago, and modern whales, you can still find a pelvis and small limb bones that provide evidence of the ancestral forms that lived on land. In this ancestor of the modern whale, the digits of the limb remain hidden within a structure that we would call a fin. Here is a diagram that shows the transition from a terrestrial form, Pachycetus, to the modern whale, an aquatic form. Evolution, a process by which modern organisms have descended from ancestral ones, descent with modification. The evolution of the modern horse is similarly well recorded in the fossil record. 
In this slide, the ancestral horse species found in rock dating back 60 million years can be seen here. All five digits are apparent. Over time, a single digit was strengthened, while others were reduced and ultimately lost. The modern horse hoof is an enlarged, highly strengthened, single digit. The transition species, displaying change over time, are nicely sequential in the fossil record, according to the dates given here. So far, I have only presented fossil evidence. Let's move on to selective breeding. The IB syllabus statement is briefly explain how artificial selection causes evolution using a specific example of selective breeding of domesticated plants or animals. Evolution through selective breeding has been occurring among domesticated plants and animals for as long as people have been farming. In the case of artificial selection, people, not nature, select the animals with the characteristics of interest. Over time, as people select only certain animals to breed, the genetic composition of the population changes. The domesticated plants or animals change according to the interests of the farmer, sheep that produce more wool, or cows that produce more milk, or plants that produce larger seeds. Cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, kale, and Brussels sprouts are all derived from a single ancestral species through artificial selection. Farmers interested in different parts of the plant for eating have selectively altered the species toward the production of, of leaves, or flower, or stem, or buds. The various breeds of dogs today are derived from a single common ancestor through selective breeding. The Heike crab is an interesting example of artificial selection. Crab fishermen in Japan, honoring the legend of a samurai warrior, would throw back any crab that appeared to have a face on its carapace. Those crabs with a plain carapace were caught and eaten. Those with any markings resembling a face were thrown back and survived. Selection. Over time, the carapace of the Heike crab population has come to be more and more like a face. So far, I've covered fossil evidence and selective breeding. Let's take a look at homologous structure. Homologous structures provide evidence of a common ancestor due to a common underlying structure. Homologous structures have different functions as can be seen here, but upon close examination, display common structure also as can be seen here. The humerus bone can be found in the arm of the human or the cat, the fin of a whale or the wing of a bat. The radius and ulna can be found in the arm of the human and the cat and the whale and the bat. Again, homologous structures display different functions but similar underlying structure providing evidence of a common ancestry, descent with modification over time. So here is an important IB syllabus statement related to homologous structures. Compare the different locomotive functions of the pentadactyl limbs of mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles. State that the underlying structure of the pentadactyl, this is the five-fingered limb, of mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles is an example of homologous structure. In this slide, showing the common ancestry of the limbs of various species, you can see the different locomotive functions. The wing of a bat is for flying, the fin of a whale is for swimming, while the forelimb of the bird is for flying, while the limb of the human is for grasping and ancestrally for moving through trees. All of the forms displayed here are derived from the ancestral five-fingered limb, the ancestral pentadactyl limb. In this diagram, you can see the ancestral pentadactyl limb that gave rise to all of these modern forms. As homologous structures, they share a common underlying ancestry, but they all have different locomotive functions. As a note, Analogous structures are structures that have a common function, but do not share a common ancestry. Let's take a look. Here's an example of an analogous structure. The wing of a bird and the wing of a butterfly both function for flying, but these structures do not at all share a common ancestor. Flight as an adaptation arose separately in each group. 
you need to know that structures can be analogous or homologous. As evidence for evolution, I've presented some detail on the fossil record, selective breeding, and homologous structure. Let's take a look at the comparative development of the embryo. Embryos of different species display common patterns of development. What we see here, the common developmental stages of the tortoise, the chicken, and the rabbit is evidence of common ancestry. It would be accurate to say that the common developmental pattern of the embryo is homologous development. As evidence for evolution, we have looked at the fossil record, selective breeding, homologous structures, and the comparative development of the embryo. Let's take a look at the molecular evidence. And the IB syllabus statement is, describe how an analysis of nucleotide sequences in different species provides evidence about common ancestry. The data on this slide represents the number of base differences among different species for a gene known as cytochrome C. You can see that the number of base differences between the human and the monkey is 1, while the number of base differences between the human and the fly is 33. The number of base differences is proportional to the time that has passed since the divergence from a common ancestor. For example, the common ancestor of the human and the monkey lived relatively recently, thus there are few base differences in the cytochrome C gene. However, the common ancestor of the human and the fly existed quite far back in time, from the point at which populations split and evolve in separate directions. Mutations occur, and those changes in the population genetics are no longer shared reproductive isolation. The number of base differences, mutations in the DNA of each species, is proportional to the time that has passed since the split, since the split from the common ancestor. The human and the monkey are more closely related than the human and the fly because their common ancestor lived more recently in time, thus less time has passed for mutations to accrue. In this diagram, examining base differences among species for the cytochrome C gene, you can see evolutionary relationships more clearly. Keep in mind that time is running along the y-axis. The human and the pig are closely related with few base differences because their common ancestor lived recently in time, whereas the common ancestor for the human and the tuna lived more distantly, thus more mutations accumulated since the split from the common ancestor. The number of base differences between the human and tuna at 31 is proportional to the time that has passed since the split from the common ancestor. The data on this slide shows the number of amino acids that differ in the hemoglobin polypeptide. Remember that the amino acid sequence of a polypeptide is determined by the nucleotide sequence in DNA. You can see that the number of amino acid differences between the human and the monkey is 8, while the number of differences between the human and the frog is 67. The human is more closely related to the monkey than the human is to the frog. The human and the monkey shared a common ancestor that lived relatively recently as compared to the common ancestor of the human and the frog. When comparing two species, the number of base differences or amino acid differences in molecules is proportional to the time that has passed since the split from the common ancestor. The less time that has passed, the more closely related two species are and the fewer number of differences in the molecules there will be. Evidence for evolution has included the fossil record, selective breeding, homologous structures, comparative embryos, and DNA evidence. Now we will go on to look at observed examples of evolution. If there was ever any doubt of the fact of evolution, observing evolution directly provides the ultimate support. In moving toward observed evidence for evolution, here is a relevant IB syllabus statement explain that populations of a species can gradually diverge into separate species by natural selection using the example of the development of melanistic insects in polluted areas. The peppered moth is an example of a melanistic insect that evolved as the environment changed. 
The evolution of the peppered moth occurred over a short period of time and has been well documented by scientists. Early on, the light colored bark of trees on which the moths lived favored moths of light color. Predatory birds would feed on the moths and the light colored moths were more suited to the environment because their coloration blended well with the light colored bark. Darker forms, the melanistic forms, were selected against as they were more visible to birds. With industrialization, the environment changed, causing the bark to be darker in color. The melanistic forms were favored, and they increased in frequency. A change in the frequency of the dark form over time in peppered moths is an example of observed evolution. This graph displays the variation in a population on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. We can see that the population varies from this end of the phenotypic range to this end of the range, from small to large, from non-hairy to hairy, from short to tall, from white to red, or whatever the phenotypic range would be. We can see few individuals at this end and few at this end, with many individuals in the center of the phenotypic range. Remember the y-axis is frequency. The original population at time one is represented by this curve. Then the environment changes and selection pressure acts against this phenotype. Individuals with this phenotype fare poorly in the, in in the environment while individuals with this phenotype do well. This phenotype survives and reproduces at rates higher than others. Their alleles increase in frequency and the phenotype of the population shifts right over time. Notice that even at time two, after selection has caused this shift in the population, variation remains. Sexual reproduction with meiosis maintains variation in the population. Here's an example to illustrate what I spoke about on the last slide. We can follow evolutionary change in the peppered moth, the melanistic insects, um, over time. Early in time, at time one, the population was mostly of a light phenotype against a background of light colored bark. The darker phenotype at time one fared poorly on this light background, but the environment changed. As pollution darkened the bark, the light form was less well suited to the new environment and the dark phenotype increased in frequency. Here's the peppered moth example, the melanistic insect example using the bell-shaped curves. Early in time, with a light bark background, the population of moths at time one is represented by this curve with light forms at this end of the spectrum and dark forms at this end of the spectrum. Then the environment changes, selecting against the lighter form. The dark form is better suited to the new environment. It reproduces at high rates, higher than the light forms. The population's genetics will shift. The allele for dark coloration increases in frequency. Evolution has occurred, and in time, this is the curve for the new darker winged population. It's important to note that Given enough time and enough selection over time, new species can arise. In other words, the populations at time two in the future could be so different from those at time one as to be designated a new species. The next IB syllabus statement is explain an example of evolution in response to environmental change using the evolution of antibiotic resistance in bacteria as your example. Antibiotic resistance is an example of natural selection and evolution. Variation in sexually reproducing populations is a given. You can see the variation here. In the case of bacteria, the genetic variation exists in the original population. In fact, the resistance exists naturally, albeit in low frequency. Then the environment changes, such as the arrival of an antibiotic to the environment. The changing environment, the arrival of the antibiotic, results in some individuals surviving and reproducing at rates higher than those around them. Over time, the genetics of the population changes with an increased frequency, 
of antibiotic resistance in the population. Similarly, when farmers spray insecticides on farm fields, as you can see in the photo, they spray onto a genetically varied population. Some individuals will survive the insecticide and then reproduce at rates higher than others. Over time, the frequency of insects resistant to the insecticide increases. Throughout this movie, I have provided various lines of evidence that support evolutionary theory. The lines of evidence are stated here, and the last piece of evidence is geographical variation among closely related populations. And here is the last IB syllabus statement. Continuous variation across the geographical range of related populations matches the concept of gradual divergence, providing evidence for evolution. The Yarrow of the Sierra Nevada Mountains shows continuous variation along a gradient. You can see in this image the physical characteristics of the Yarrow change from the low altitude on the left to the high altitude on the right due to different environmental conditions here as compared to here populations of Yarrow have diverged gradually across the gradient of temperature or rainfall or both. Continuous variation across the geographical range of related populations matches the concept of gradual divergence, providing evidence for evolution. The willow ptarmigan seen in the two images on the left and the red grouse seen in the two images on the right are the same species, Legopus legopus, but continuous variation across a geographical range has resulted in divergence and changes in physical characteristics as can be seen in these images. The changes in physical characteristics have been so profound that for many years these birds were thought to be different species, but they're not. Now, the greater the geographical separation and the longer the populations have been separated, the greater the divergence will be and the greater the likelihood of possible speciation. Salamander populations in California have diverged as populations have spread to either side of the Sierra Nevada mountains. What we see now is continuous variation in salamander populations across a geographical range, and these populations have gradually diverged into separate species by natural selection in a process known as speciation. Continuous variation across a geographical range of related populations matches the concept of gradual divergence, providing evidence for evolution. And that brings us to the end of IB Bio, Diversity, Evolution, and Classification, CORE, SLHL, Part 1. We will look at the mechanism of natural selection in Part 2.